my approach and kind of other people's approach to it. Uh, so first of all, you know, I'm a young guy, so I think of like a cool title. Um, so this is what I came up with, but then I also had this like <laughs> subtitle. And if you guys don't know what's going on in this situation, uh, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so as the uh, Dr. Lovers was doing a talk last week on like innovation and creativity in education, and he, you know, he faked having this heart attack and the shameless attempt to kind of use his own body to promote himself. He took off his own shirt and was showing off his body. So um, this is kind of what happened. You it worked see, better than any talk I've ever given. Yeah, I mean, he was he was internet famous, like no doubt, internet famous. Get so, risk factors there. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say that. That's pretty terrible. <laughs> so, but I heard it was uh, I heard it was very convincing. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about is, like I said, is intubation in uh, cardiac arrest, and it's a very controversial topic. You know, you think it'd be very straightforward. As we talk about reasons to intubate, um, this was a nice little chart I found that did it A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, you know, and in here, you know, a lot of people who are in cardiac arrest are um, going to have a disability of some type. They're not going to be able to protect their airway. So it kind of makes sense that you would, you know, intubate them and take that airway for them. Um, I thought this was really funny also because they use feral. It's like, some, I guess if somebody's just acting crazy, you can't really. Um, so they call that feral. So I thought that was, that was kind of funny. Um, but, you know, also, on the, on the flip side of that, if somebody's in cardiac arrest and they, um, you find them in B-fib and you shock them and they wake up, they don't necessarily need an airway. So that kind of, kind of intubating everyone isn't like, um, isn't like a catch-all statement. Uh, and then, you know, it is controversial. Um, there have been multiple studies that have conflicting evidence on this, which is why it's a controversy. Um, these were just a few that I picked out that had different um, conclusions. You know, some said, that those who received ET tubes did worse, those who received ET tubes did better, um, those who received superglottic airways did better. There's all kinds of different evidence out there. I'm gonna go over two of the bigger studies um, that I found looking into it a little bit, um, but like I said, it's controversial. So um, what I say isn't necessarily gospel, um, but you know, we'll talk about the guidelines and we'll talk about the big evidence, um, but just realize that it's controversial and there are alternatives out there. So this is um, an evidence summary from the 2015 guidelines of ACLS, and it says that there's inadequate evidence to support um, using bag, bag, bag BVM versus uh, endotracheal intubation or other advanced airways devices such as supraglottic airways. So there is a paucity of um, good literature out there. But um, the recommendations are you can use a bag valve mask, you can use an advanced airway, you can intubate. So they, they leave it kind of open to the provider. And um, what kind of things you should take into account are one, the situation, one, the amount of personnel that you have, and um, you know your comfort with intubating. <laughs> I like a good intubation as much as anyone else, but intubating during CPR is hard. Like, we do that. That's what we do here. Um, we go to all the floor codes, um, and it's it's tough. And you know, we intubate quite a bit here at UK, um, and I feel pretty comfortable with intubation. But intubating, especially with direct laryngoscopy with just a laryngoscope, that's tough um, when somebody's getting chest compressions. <clears throat> and most importantly, chest compressions are what they need, not necessarily um, an endotracheal tube. So you don't want to stop those chest compressions just to put in an endotracheal tube. So um, I say that because if someone is not intubating often, it may be more beneficial to the patient to either bag, if you're more comfortable with that, if you're good at that, or to put in a supraglottic airway. Uh, so this is one of the bigger studies uh, out there. Um, I'm not going to read through all of this, but this was, you know, just the association of survival and neurologic outcome um, in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest uh, compared to what type of airway management that they got. So this is, like I said, it's a huge study. I mean, hundreds of thousands of patients. And these were adult patients, so it's a little different. You have to kind of think about that. But any type of advanced airway management was associated with decreased odds of neurologically favorable survival compared to just bad valve mass. So that's interesting, right? That's kind of counter, uh, counterintuitive to a lot of people and counterintuitive to what we're even taught. So um, <clears throat> kind of interesting. 
This is a very recent study. This is in hospital cardiac arrest. This study has caused um, quite a stir uh, among a lot of people on social media, just in general, um, because of what it says. And it, it's very similar to, to the last study, but this is in, in hospital patients. And this one also has a ton of patients, tens of thousands of patients. Um, those with in hospital cardiac arrest who were intubated early um, in their resuscitation actually did worse. Um, it's just a correlation. It's just retrospective evidence. So it's not super strong, but it is a lot of patients and it is a correlation. So it's something to think about. Um, they didn't make any recommendations based on that, but the, you know, they, the findings here don't support early, early tracheal intubation for these patients in cardiac arrest. Not necessarily applicable to out of cardi cardiac um, arrest, but is something to think about. So um, some big reasons to intubate in an arrest um, that I think about, if you can't ventilate a patient, um, if you're not able to bag a patient, that's probably a reason to intubate, right? Um, it's hard to determine someone's oxygenation when they're in cardiac arrest because you can't do a pulse ox a lot of the time. They're not getting good enough perfusion to be able to do that. Uh, if you suspect that the reason that they arrested was from a respiratory event, um, then it's probably reasonable to intubate that person. Um, it's hard to tell that initially, but um, you know, if you think it's COPD or, or something along those lines, um, I think that's reasonable. Uh, if there's some kind of impending doom, if you know they're arresting because they have angioedema or they're arresting because they have an expanding neck hematoma um, or something along those lines where they need an airway right now, if they're aspirating, if they're actively vomiting, that kind of thing, it makes sense to intubate in that situation. Um, if you have an adequate number of providers with the skill level to be able to intubate without a cessation in CPR, I think that's reasonable, especially if you have a video laryngoscope. And that's kind of how we do it at UK. Uh, when a patient comes in and arrests, if we, we usually have a lot of residents around. So we'll have somebody at the head of the bed with a video laryngoscope. We don't stop chest compressions. They take a look, they put the tube in if they can. If they can't, they wait for the pause when we're doing a pulse check and they put the, um, put the endotracheal tube in. There have been a couple occasions where um, for whatever reason, we don't have enough providers around. Um, and if it's just me and another person, we'll just put a superglottic airway down or if we can bag them, we'll just bag them. Um, so that's kind of how, how we go about it. In children and infants, um, Dr. Carter can attest to this they're much more likely to have arrested because of um, a respiratory event um, as opposed to a cardiac event um, as compared to adults. So that's something to consider in children and infants. I did find a couple studies that uh, looked at supraglottic airways and just BVM in kiddos, um, but there wasn't quite as much evidence out there. Um, so it is something to consider. We intubate kids even less than adults, and that's a super scary uh, situation to be intubating a kid in cardiac arrest. So that is also something else to consider. Um, but like I said, they're much more likely to have arrested from a respiratory event. Uh, and then we'll just talk a little bit about alternatives. Um, and we'll kind of go through some of these with, with all this stuff up here um, at the end or whenever. If you guys are interested, you can come up and play with this stuff. Um, we've got a whole plethora of things up here. Um, so the first one up in the corner is an eye gel, um, which is kind of a, a newer thing and something I'm I'm pretty keen on. We don't have yet. Um, Dr. Lovers actually brought this one in. It's very similar to a laryngeal mask airway in LMA, um, but doesn't require you to blow up anything. It just kind of fits right, um, right back there. You just put it down, blindly place it. Um, it usually goes in the right spot. Um, and it's pretty nifty because you can put um, like an NG tube down, like a gastric port. Um, you can also intubate through these. Uh, you kind of have to use either a fiber optic or, or try it blind, um, but you can do that. It does take a really small tube to be able to do it, but you can do it. Um, but these, these are pretty nifty. Uh, the one down there. Because uh, yeah. The eye gels actually, they, the heat warms that green portion and actually molds to the rest right. of your pharynx. So that's why there's no balloon involved. Yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to. <clears throat> We looked at this, um, you know, PHI is a national consortium of medical directors. We switched January, uh, December, got rid of all our uh, Kings and all our LMAs, and we switched all the aircraft alternative airways to eye gels. Yeah, That's how, how much we were impressed last July when we had our medical directors conference nationally. They're super so, slick. Yeah, go ahead. And I don't have yeah. any stock in eye gel, just 
I'll ask you afterwards, actually. Yeah. yeah. I, I have something to add to that. A lot of people use kings, but, um, you know, the smallest <clears> thing you can get is under is 22 pounds is the max yeah. uh, weight. So um, what do you use for your pediatric patient? Or what do you use for that pediatric population under that? And so you need to uh, think about that with your yeah. If you If you have kings, you don't want to exhaust your stock. You can still buy it. I can tell you our neonatal transport team uses um, not the IGELs, the LMAs. Tiny little LMAs. Yes, yeah, that's what they so. use for a lot of transports. Same reason. And these are veteran transport folks who expert in kids, and they still prefer using LMAs in the neonates in a rural hospital and in rural transport. They're secure. They work beautiful. Yeah, and um, a lot of pediatric anesthesiologists will use that for, for short cases and sedations for like MRIs and things like that. They'll just put an LMA in. Um, it's not a complete definitive airway, right? They can still aspirate, but it is pretty good. Um, you can ventilate and you can save somebody's life that, that way if you can't intubate for whatever reason, put down a uh, LMA or an IGEL. Um, what we have are the LMAs, which are, are down there. Um, that's what we use for supraglottic airways right now. They, they're also pretty slick, super easy to put in. Um, you guys are welcome to come practice after this, but, but literally you just go across the roof of the mouth, um, shove it down to the resistance uh, and blow it up. Um, you can bag through it, do all the stuff you need to. There are some that you can intubate through, which is kind of nice, um, especially with uh, a fiber optic scope. Uh, the combi tube, um, we don't see very often anymore, occasionally. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, King, we see occasionally, um, and they, they tend to per work pretty well um, that I've seen. Um, you guys probably have more experience with them than I, than I do even, um, but they tend to work pretty decently. Um, and then the ones over on the, the right are kind of some interesting new stuff uh, that I haven't got to play with yet, uh, but interesting video laryngoscopes that are fairly portable. Uh, the one on the top, I, I had never seen before until I was making this talk. Uh, but it's an LMA that actually has a, a video on the end of it. So you could theoretically <clears throat> put the LMA down, be able to see the cords and intubate through it because it's an intubating LMA. So that's pretty slick. Uh, the graph down in the down the right um, is a video of the laryngoscope that's kind of portable. So that's kind of awesome too. Here we use what's called the CMAC, um, which is similar to a glide scope. It's a video laryngoscope, but the uh, blade that you use is very similar to a direct uh, laryngoscope blade. Uh, so you use it just like a DL blade. It's, it's pretty nice. Um, we can use it like a DL. Our attendings, our bosses can watch what we see on the screen so they don't have to be over our shoulder kind of yelling at us, what do you see, what do you see, what do you see, that kind of thing. So the combi tube, uh, we already kind of mentioned, and this was a response I got from Dr. Lubbers about a combi tube. Um, he, we were talking about what we were going to use, and he said, except maybe a combi tube because F that noise. Um, so he's not a big fan of the combi tube, obviously. Um, like I said, we don't see him very much in the, anymore. Um, we see the king probably more so than anything. The eye gel we were kind of already talking about. The, there's a nice little video that, that describes the insertion on the website, but it is super simple um, just watching it. Uh, like I said, you can, you can intubate through it. You can look at the cords all kinds of neat little stuff, um, and it's pretty easy to do. It has a bite block, which is really nice. Um, your patient can't bite down on it, um, so that's great. So big pain cone points. Uh, intubating in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is controversial. Um, you've got to think about your skill level. You've got to think about uh, your transport. You've got to think about what is actually going on, why did they arrest, that kind of thing. Um, kiddos are more likely to be a respiratory arrest, so you got to think about that when they're when they're in cardiac arrest. Um, if you're going to do it, be skilled, be quick. Um, don't interrupt CPR for it, and if you have video laryngoscopes, use them. Uh, don't interrupt CPR. Like I said, a supraglottic airway can be super useful. It can save someone's life um, if, for whatever reason, you can't ventilate. Um, but uh, that's something to definitely have in your back pocket. And you know, proper BVM technique. Preferably two-hand technique if you have the personnel is fantastic. So, thanks you guys. You're welcome to come up and play with this stuff if you want to. Um, go ahead. It just on the um, again national level with my PHI experience, looking at 45 bases, maybe eight years ago we looked at comparing combi tubes to King Airways, and our crews had a much higher success rate with King Airways for blind placements, so we got rid of the combi tubes. And then, just so you're aware, this isn't an opinion about intubating in the field by EMS, but clearly I have an opinion about everything, especially that picture up there. Um, <laughs> PHI has a standard policy of two attempts, and then we go to an alternative airway. 
not a rescue airway, not a failed airway, an alternative airway. And every intubation PHI does in the field is with a bougie because you don't know what you're getting in to look at before you start. So we do, and that includes a look with a blade. If a blade touches the posterior pharynx, that counts as one attempt. So two attempts, if it's unsuccessful, not failed, we just move on to the eye gel. And that's with experienced flight nurses and medics who've been practicing intubation, do it in the ER, who've probably done more than most people in the field um, other than other flight crews. And that's what PHI's national policy is. So that's um, what we use, how you implement into your service is up to you all. <clears throat> Any questions? Yeah. Does anybody know what temperature the IGL cup actually in place of? No, 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 no. Yeah, I think the biggest problem with that, and one of the things I think you might be alluding to, if you have trucks that you place outside in a hot environment, will those um, uh, gel that gelatin in, um, expand yeah. in a hot truck? That's I have many questions about that. Oh, cold bag. Yeah, that's yeah. A, that's George yeah, cold bag, cold, cold patient. That. Well, so that's the thing is that um, yeah. I was uh, I was up at UC uh, recently, and they were they were preaching preaching the gospel of the IGL, and they they were saying that it actually will work in hypothermic patients, mm -hmm. which was confusing to me because yeah. that would suggest that that cup should be uh, liquefying or whatever like right now. Yeah. All right. So. Okay. It's uh, soft to begin with, though. Yeah. Yeah. It, and that's what it's standard temperature in, and then it just molds better to the airway. Yeah, if you go right. feel it, it's not rigid yeah. plastic that warms up and then like gum molds. Yeah, yeah. Gum. Even without it molding, it, it'll make a pretty good seal. It's just, and that tip is still angulated that fits into the esophagus. Palette. Palette. Into with, a with a continuous, continuous but gentle, gentle push. push. Until, until a definitive, definitive resistance, resistance is felt. Is felt. Yeah, so even without the mold, Do not, not apply, apply excessive force on the device during insertion. insertion. Really loud. It, is it is not, not necessary, necessary to insert to fingers, fingers or thumbs, or thumbs into, into the patient's, patient's mouth. So, during yeah, the it molds pretty well even without the... Uh, I understand it a lot better since he's English. Well, <laughs> 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 and how it is for me. I get it now. That's fine with LMAs. Like I just I think they work fabulous. And just um, people but don't we need them for more steps problems. to the cuff and inflation. It's a disservice to the population. So we're going to go to protocol where some patient Yeah, feel free to come up and play uh, with our stuff. We'll just get around all the mouth to mouth issues. No, I was Thank you. Thank you. On that too. So, I gel actually, uh, my particular little go bag that I've made for my car, 